Thank you very much. Thank you for having me today. Universities today teach the same way that universities taught practically a thousand years ago, before the advent of the printing press. Before the introduction of the printing press, let alone the internet, access to information was scarce. It was hard to get knowledge. And universities were initially set up to find a way to distribute knowledge. Very important and noble task. But around 500 years ago, that task became somewhat less important as the printing press enabled the distribution of knowledge to a much broader and more accepting, uh, acceptance, um, or acceptable uh, or audience. At the same time, people whose education developed alongside the printing press were able to consume that information better and better. Fast forward to the 20th century, global literacy rates skyrocketed. The majority of people in the world now have access to information. And more importantly, the internet has further lowered barriers to disseminating information. But when we see what universities are still doing, they are, for the large part, disseminating information. A professor stands on a stage like I am, in front of a crowd of individuals like you are, and recites facts, recites data, sometimes recites interpretations, but still transmits knowledge, professes knowledge, where professor comes from, from one individual to a crowd. Obviously, you can lecture to a thousand people or a million people using technology, but you still lecture. You can disseminate information that people are ready to receive using adaptive knowledge. Useful, but it's still a dissemination. Not a university to teach you a skill, not a university to teach you knowledge for the sake of knowledge, but an institution that would develop the mind to an extent that you would learn transferable, practical knowledge. The current universities aren't selecting professors based on broad, applicable knowledge. They're selecting professors based on narrow expertise, often rigidly so. Right? People who explore a particular bioenergetic uh, a concept, right? We'll have a theory as to the best way to optimize that bioenergetic channel. And there'll be other researchers halfway around the world that believe that that is the wrong way and that they know the right way. And they will spend 20 or 30 years battling one another trying to figure out which element or which perspective is correct. Now that's important for science. It's important for the advancement of knowledge. It's not particularly useful for education. Right? In education, you want somebody who is much more open-minded, who's broad, who can apply ideas in different contexts. But the current educational system doesn't promote that kind of thinking, certainly not the current tenure system. And so at Minerva, we don't have tenure. We pick professors that have extremely high fluid intelligence, that are very broad in their interests. And we find that those professors are far, far better educators than the ones that are very narrow, right? despite being world-renowned, perhaps, in a particular field. We evaluate and assess professors on how well they teach, which is kind of a shocking idea in education. We forget that most people in academia get their jobs not based on how well they actually practice that part of their profession, but on how well or how quickly they publish. 
which again has almost nothing to do with the educational enterprise. Right? This is a problem. Right? We would not want to take our sick child to a doctor who isn't measured on how well he cures the child, but more so on how well he cooks. One is not particularly relevant to the other. You could say, well, you know, if you cook well, you have to know how to blend ingredients and think about proportion. You have to have steady hands. That's really useful for a surgeon. More useful is actually to measure how well they do surgery. But at the same time, we send our children for brain surgery, which is what education is. Rewires your brain. And have them operated on by people who are not trained in brain surgery, who don't have a program for brain surgery, who aren't evaluated on how well they perform brain surgery, and yet we're perfectly happy sending our children through that pathway. That's a problem. And so not only do we evaluate our professors on how well they teach, we also train them. We, in fact, spend a month untraining and retraining our professors in the methodologies of fully active learning right, and measuring and teaching habits and concepts. The one world challenge that I'm most passionate about is education. I believe that education not only benefits the individuals, but benefits everyone around them all the way up to the society as a whole. Education is the root of much of what is good about society and humanity. Be it war, be it uh, poverty, be it gender equality, increasing availability to education will solve a lot of these, these issues downstream. I keep thinking of like the Indian mathematician Ramanujan. He came from nothing in India and was just lucky enough to find a book. And how many, you know, Einsteins or Ramanujans are we losing in places where kids don't have access to education? What excited me most was the prospect of being able to invent university education from scratch. The bar is set very high here for what we're trying to achieve. I like having to try to meet that challenge every day. Here, what we're trying to teach is how students can become involved in their communities, small and large, local and global, and try to figure out how to make the world a better place. The world does not divide itself cleanly along disciplinary lines, at least real problems don't. Our curriculum is designed to dissolve disciplinary boundaries and teach students about how to relate approaches between fields and between those silos. I teach the empirical analysis cornerstone. It's about how scientific thinking can be and should be used in our everyday lives, even if we're not scientists, if, even if that's not our chosen profession or career. It's important to have that logical and systematic framework when thinking about problems. I would encourage young students today to follow their passion, to not set limits on themselves. They have the power to change the world. The craziest thing I ever did in college was to participate in the free speech movement at Berkeley. Defending free speech was really important to me because my parents had to flee Germany and Austria. We knew as a family what not having free speech and having democratic rights curtailed meant. So, Coming to the United States and seeing free speech throughout society, but seeing it curtailed the minute you stepped into campus property seemed like a great injustice. What excites me the most about Minerva's curriculum is the ability for students to really craft their degree to meet their lifelong goals and desires. When I was in college, I wish someone had told me how much fun it would be to be a scientist. At the time, I was passionate about scuba diving and music. Then I took my first biology class, learned about cells, learned about genetics, and I never looked back. 
My field of expertise is the cognitive neuroscience of music and pattern perception in the human brain. I think my earliest memory of music was lying on the floor of our living room when I was three years old, underneath the piano as my mom was playing, and watching her feet move the pedals up and down, and just being enveloped by the sound all around me. I think, like most teachers, I find my inspiration to teach from the students. Our faculty are very smart and very accomplished at what they do, but their focus is not on themselves, not on the faculty, but on the students. Another thing that isn't particularly useful when it comes to this form of education is not giving students the ability to apply what they've learned. One of the most useful ways of teaching useful knowledge, practical knowledge, is to actually allow students to apply it in the real world situations. Another example, air traffic controllers the individuals that are, help planes land on time are notoriously good critical thinkers. They have to manage how airplanes come, sometimes manually, especially before the age of computers, and account for changing conditions, changing weather patterns, human error in pilots, etc. And so a researcher decided to give air traffic controllers a general critical thinking test to see how they would score. Turns out they scored exactly the same as any other professional. No difference. Because what they learn to think critically, the decisions that they learn how to make on the job are not translatable to other areas. And so we have one of the dilemmas, dilemma number one. How do you actually teach practical, useful knowledge, which is crucial for our form of government? And when I say our, I mean practically the entire world's form of government, for our society. How do you actually teach concepts that could be contextualized and recontextualized? Problem number one. Problem number two, the methodology of, of teaching. I mentioned that universities are teaching in the same way as they did for hundreds of years. Now think about what else we would find acceptable today to be practicing the way that it was practiced hundreds of years ago. Let's take medicine as an example. Let's assume that you all are, uh, ate something bad for lunch and you got a bacterial infection. And you go to a doctor and the doctor says, I'll give you one of two choices. Choice number one, I have an antibiotic here, which has been tested and studied to kill this bacteria with a 90% efficacy rate. Choice number two is I'll take a leech and I'll put it on your arm and he'll suck out your blood. Anybody think the leech is a good idea? No. No, no, bad idea. Funny enough, the leech on your arm, though far less effective than the anti antibiotic, is actually three times more effective at curing your illness than going to a university lecture is at learning the material. That's pretty impressive, because the placebo effect giving you medication that doesn't actually do anything to cure you, but just triggers your body to start fighting the infection, is effective around 30% of the time. 